everyone, this is Victor from Cyborg for Life, and today I have a very special interview for you. He's a very talented and experienced limb lengthening and deformity reconstruction surgeon and part of the elite team of surgeons at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. Please enjoy the interview with Dr. Taylor Reef. All right, everyone, today we have a very special guest joining us. He is a member of the Limb Lengthening and Complex Reconstruction Service at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. Not only does he specialize in correcting leg length discrepancies, complex deformities, and boosting the height of his patients seeking cosmetic stature lengthening, but he's also among the best in orthopedic oncology, treating bone tumors, metastatic disease, infections, and much more, giving his patients peace of mind that their bones will remain healthy in the long run. Please join me in welcoming world-renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Taylor Reef. Dr. Reef, how are you? Doing very well, thank you. Excellent, excellent. Well, thanks so much for joining me. It's always great to have more talent coming from the HSS. So, um, the home of the great Dr. Rosbrook, since he's there. So, to lead us off, uh, Dr. Reef, I just want to kind of mention some of your qualifications here. So, you earned your medical degree at North Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine, achieving acceptance into the Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Society. You did residency at Loyola University Medical Center in Chicago with two fellowships, the Anna King at the University of Florida Shands Cancer Center, and the Limb Lengthening and Complex Reconstruction Fellowship at the HSS. More of your accomplishments include being an assistant professor of orthopedics at Whale Cornell Medical College, um, and many awards include the Standout Gavril Award in Limb Lengthening and Reconstruction in the recent 2020, named after the godfather of limb lengthening, Gavril Elizarov. Uh, you're also involved in affiliate involved and affiliated with several societies and associations, showing you're up to date with the latest and greatest in the field of orthopedics. All right, so Dr. Reef, to start, I just wanna, I always ask the question of how you got interested in the field of limb lengthening, deformity correction, and orthopedic oncology. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, throughout my training, I realized that um, certain people, you know, presented with, you know, bigger problems, greater problems that were going to require, you know, bigger solutions. And, um, you know, I think those patients really attracted me. And uh, I didn't, I didn't want to be able to have to shy away from any problem, you know, that uh, presented to me. So, you know, while there's a lot of orthopedic surgeons out there doing good things with arthroscopy and joint replacements and things, I thought, um, those might just be a little too repetitive for me. And I kind of wanted to make sure I was tackling uh, new different problems, uh, you know, every week of my life and mm -hmm. keeping it interesting, but also, you know, making a huge impact in, uh, you know, people's well-being because, you know, anyone who presents obviously with something like cancer, it's going to be life-changing, but, um, you know, even deformities, the leg length discrepancies, you know, hugely impact someone's function. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Myself being a leg length, leg length discrepancy patient, a former one. Uh, so I can attest to that. Now, Dr. Reef, you being the expert in bone uh, oncology, can you explain what bone cancer is and how can a typical case be treated? Right. So bone cancer kind of uh, comes in two varieties. There's primary bone cancer, which is actually cancer that stems from the bone cells themselves. Um, this is uh, usually in the form of something either called osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, or chondrosarcoma. Those are the, kind of the three most common. And so those are actually problems that stem from the bone cells themselves. And um, those can happen throughout life. A lot of those happen more in like adolescence, the osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma. Um, and then there's cancer that has come from some other part of the body, um, you know, lung cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, that then travels to the bone and, you know, sets up shop there in that area. So it's still breast cancer, it's still lung cancer, it just happens to be within the bone, and we call that a metastasis. Um, so, you know, very, you know, different kind of treatment uh, algorithms when you see those two types of things. But, you know, on a x-ray, it can be hard to tell, you know, apart what you're looking at. So um, often, you know, that's what, you know, why we biopsy things is to learn the difference between which tumor we're dealing with. Gotcha. Very cool. Um, now, Dr. Reef, many patients, when they go through with limb lengthening, they fear developing a bone tumor complication as a result of the procedure itself. How likely is it to happen, you know, from just getting, let's say, stature limb lengthening or uh, getting a leg length discrepancy fix? How likely is it to happen? And does this pose a risk to prospective patients? 
Yeah, I would say if you're just a standard patient undergoing a limb lengthening, it, it, it essentially poses no risk. It's okay. not something that um, is reported in our literature, not something people are seeing. Um, you know, you do get a lot of growth factors that come into that area when you're trying to lengthen a bone. You get more vascularity mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you're trying to grow new tissue. But, um, you know, that and we worried about that when you're trying to lengthen a bone that has, you know, kind of abnormal tissue in it. Let's say you have um, a condition where you have cartilage in the bone called enchondromatosis. Um, you know, there was a fear kind of that that would, lead, if you lengthen that, it would lead to some sort of cancer development. And they actually showed that, you know, other centers throughout the world, throughout time, uh, that usually just turns into normal bone and does not become cancerous. So, um, yeah, there's really not an association between limb lengthening and uh, cancer development. Okay, good. That's going to reassure a lot of patients because I get messages about once a week asking about bone cancer. So very cool. Um, now, I'm sure you've heard of it. The, the stride nail from Nuvasiv was recently recalled this year. Many patients who had their surgery scheduled had to reschedule and postpone them. But a lot of patients who have the implant inside their bone still are fearful of the corrosion, the reason why it was recalled, and that it could cause some sort of have some sort of carcinogen, carcinogenic properties that could lead to cancer down the line. What is your take on this? Is there any merit to this statement? Yeah. You know, I think obviously we don't want there to be corrosion inside the body. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I would tell those patients that, um, you know, they should get their nails removed, of course, as mm -hmm. they were going to anyways, but that, you know, it's not unless they're having significant pain um, that they should still wait for their bone to heal before yeah. getting the implants removed. Um, and certainly they need to be talking to their doctor and have a, a close a relationship with them, you know, because the timing may change. We may want to try to take those out sooner uh, than we otherwise would have. But um, if we look at, you know, what happened with total hips, you know, which have struggled with the problem of corrosion over time, um, while that can lead to changes in the body, you know, resorption of the bone, osteolysis, um, as we call it, um, there was never an association between that and developing cancer. So I don't think uh, for those pe these people um, who have strides and that that should be their primary concern. You know, I think mm -hmm. can the corrosion cause damage to the bone? It can, you know, mm -hmm. we're seeing that on x-ray um, and not, it's not happening in everyone. And, mm -hmm. you know, there are select patients who are getting it uh, worse than others, but, um, and like I said, I think they should be removed, but I don't think um, there's a risk for developing cancer. Excellent. Excellent. Well, you guys heard it right here from the X-ray himself. So no rush, but do get your nails removed when your bone is consolidated. Awesome. Dr. Reef, um, recently I received a question from a prospective patient who found this article on the internet. And he said that he said that taller people are more susceptible to, de to develop cancer and that it, you know, he's worried that if he gets the limb thing surgery to, uh, done to get taller, that he's going to naturally have this um, complication because of that. <laughs> is this just a bizarre statement or does it actually have some merit behind it as well? Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, I have heard reports, you know, more in like veterinary literature that, you know, larger animals can be more susceptible to developing cancers in humans. I've never come across that. Okay. Um, you know, I've never seen an association between, um, height and, uh, cancer development. Um, could there be some paper out there that shows that it's possible? I'd love for, you know, someone to share that with me just for my own knowledge. But right. um, I don't think if you were to get limb lengthening, for instance, your body is going to still, other than, you know, that segment of your limb, I think if you're a five, six person, you're the rest of your body is still going to think you're a five, six person, even okay. if you're then five, nine, that's kind of, that's how you were made. That's how you grew up and developed. So I don't think having that extra height is going to put, an additional stress on your body metabolically that's going to somehow lead to the development of cancer. Um, you know, real, for cancer to develop, you need, um, you know, changes that happen within the DNA itself, um, you know, which leads to changes in proteins that then become oncogenic and uh, produce a cancer. But um, I don't think the process of limb lengthening, um, you know, is going to lead to that because uh, you, you do create new tissue and you may get hypertrophy of tissue and, you know, some division of cells, but mm -hmm. not you know, not development of cancer. So I don't think, yeah. you know, someone who, you know, wants to be three inches taller, for instance, needs to worry, well, is this going to increase my cancer risk down the road? Like, <laughs> I, I don't at all. Uh, I, 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 that's not even something I would discuss with a patient, because I, I don't think it would be so 
hypothetical and not something that you know is being seen or reported and you know i think i think 20 years ago 30 years ago i don't we wouldn't be able to answer that question but i think there's enough people mm-hmm. who are have undergone limb lengthening and have a long follow up at this point that um, you know, if that were the case, we'd be, we'd be seeing that, you know, yeah. there'd be more reports of that at this point and, mm-hmm. and we used to have it. So. Awesome. Um, now regarding your leg length discrepancy patients, I actually had a, a patient who has a leg length discrepancy reach out to me recently. And he said that his shorter, he had two tibias, one is shorter. And he said that the shorter tibia has more slack in it. Um, I think he, what he meant is that the muscle felt weaker and it was smaller than his taller leg but he felt like it had more muscle slack. Can you elaborate a little bit on this? And is it due to possibly a genetic reason or is it due to some structural issue? Yeah, well, if, so we certainly know when we lengthen bones that the muscles do get more taut and Mm -hmm. need to, you know, respond to that over time. Um, When you normally develop your, your muscles are kind of developing along with the bone. So unless there's been some change in the bone length, I wouldn't anticipate there being any slack in the bone. Now, if you shorten a bone, which, you know, we do do for some reasons for a variety of purposes, um, that is a case where you would develop slack in the muscle and it actually takes some time, uh, you know, to kind of compensate for that. So if you shorten a femur, for instance, by even a couple centimeters, the quadriceps do develop some slack in it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you have to basically build up the muscle and work that muscle again to be able to fully extend your knee. Um, But if if this was, you know, I I don't know this patient, you know, or person's exact scenario, but if the limb hasn't changed the length, I wouldn't Mm -hmm. expect there to be slack, you know, even if it's shorter or longer um, than the other tibia. And if the other tibia had undergone lengthening, then I would expect it would have been more taut, sure, by right relative to the other one, but that that would also then kind of um, work itself out over time. Right, right. The body and the muscles would adja- adapt to it. Yeah, um, right. Now, considering your cosmetic limb lengthening, uh, stature limb lengthening patients, when they come to see you for consultation, what's your typical process for evaluating them and assessing them? Because a lot of patients are worried about you know the doctor just setting them up for surgery and not really checking for bone ab- abnormalities, uh, you know, walking gait, you know. Um, structural uh, alignment issues and stuff like that. What's your process? Do you just um, see their x-rays? Yeah. Can you go into that a little bit? No, I think so. Part of our philosophy, uh, basically, even if someone's coming in for, you know, a stature lengthening versus any other problem is they're still going to get a full evaluation to start with, you know, medical history, you know, full physical exam, including gait analysis, you know, what's the rotation um, and range of motion of all the joints. Um, because even if, you know, you're going to do a stature lengthening on somebody, you still want to know, for instance, you know, are there, um, and you're going to do it in the femurs, uh, let's say, um, if their rotation is, you know, malaligned some way, that's an opportunity that you can also change the rotation. So you want to do a thorough physical exam um, because, you know, that's kind of an opportunity that you would have missed if you, if you didn't assess the rotation beforehand. Right. Um, and so, you know, certainly x-ray analysis of, um, any bones that are going to, you know, not only a standing x-ray, but, um, orthogonal x-rays of the involved bone. Um, and, you know, certainly any other, uh, assessment of other painful joints, because they may play a role, um, in the lengthening process. You really want, um, as healthy a limb as you can when you're lengthening, um, and, you know, stable joint on either side of the lengthening. So, um, it's important to give everyone kind of a, a full evaluation so that, you know, there's no surprises. I love it. I love it. I love the thorough evaluation. Very cool. Now for patients who need an external fixator, you know, for lengthening and or deformity correction, how com- common are bone infections due to the pin sites? Because we know that this is exposed to the outside environment. Um, and you treat a lot of infections as well in your, your scope of practice. Um, but I know a lot of patients are seeking these options due to the stride nail being removed and these, you know, external fixators being somewhat more affordable. But can you go a little bit into that in terms of bone infection and what the rates yeah. are? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, fixators are still a tool um, that someone in my position needs to know how to use uh, because they're very versatile. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I tell patients who are going to go into a fixator for any amount of time, you know, a couple months, um, you know, I basically tell them to expect at least one pin tract infection. Um, But a pin tract infection, you know, starts at the skin and that's really where we like to contain it to. So um, we have a very low threshold to just start oral antibiotics for a short course to try to tackle that pin tract infection right away. 
It's actually very uncommon that um, those pin tract infections end up being deep infections in the bone. Oh, okay. So, you know, um, you know, looking at my partner and kind of partners in their experience, you know, only a handful of times have they needed to remove something, for instance, or actually take apart the fixator because of a deep infection. You know, it's yeah, among hundreds of, of trials of this, it, it really, you can almost always make it to the end um, with just kind of courses of oral antibiotics right. um, and not developing a deep bone infection. I mean, it certainly makes sense. You know, you have these pins and wires going in and out of the bone through the skin, but um, you know, I think bone is still resilient to infection. And um, you know, as long as you're, you know, keeping tabs on your patients and making sure, you know, treating, treating them at the first signs of something going awry, mm -hmm. um, that that really uh, can be prevented. Now, Dr. Reef, a father recently reached out to me and he asked about his 16-year-old son who's going to get uh, the procedure done um, using a technique called cross-lateral tibia femur lengthening, uh, whereas like one femur is getting lengthened, the opposite tibia is getting lengthened. And the surgeon kind of didn't really disclose the reasons of why he wanted to get this done or do it this way. From your perspective, could you shed some light on what his reasons might be and what is the benefit versus the downsides of doing it this way? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the benefit of doing it is that, you know, when you're lengthening limbs, um, you, it is nice if, you know, they kind of keep track, you know, with one another, you're kind of lengthening, you know, both so that you're not needing shoe lifts and things. If you lengthen one limb, you know, you're going to end up being centimeters off from the other limb, but <laughs> it's also not gaining length. So I think, you know, the benefit is they kind of keep pace with one another. Mm -hmm. Um in terms of the downsides, you know, the problem is if you're, you're doing a femur and a tibia, the tibia is probably going to be lengthened slower. Right. And it's probably, you know, in general, it's not going to be able to be lengthened as much as the femur. Mm -hmm. um, so you're probably going to end up with some discrepancy for some amount of time, mm -hmm. um, you know, until you come back. Now, you know, there would be scenarios where if, let's say, you know, one femur was very short and the contralateral tibia was very short, that I could see that making sense. But mm -hmm. Um, you know, in general, I would say it, it makes more sense to kind of do both femurs mm -hmm. and then do um, both tibias. A, because I also think just the rehab is then um, a little simpler because, mm -hmm. you know, when you're doing the femurs, there needs to be a lot of focus on physical therapy for the hips and the knees. And, right. you know, you don't have to worry about the ankles quite as much. But mm -hmm. um, when you're, um, when you're lengthening the tibia, you know, keeping the Achilles tendon uh, supple and doing a lot of therapy on the ankle is very important. So, um, you know, unless, unless a patient really had a reason for needing femur and tibia, you know, at the same time, you know, that would not uh, generally be my preference. You mentioned physical therapy. I want to dive right into that now. Um, with all your patients, your lengthening patients and patients that you treat, how important is physical therapy? Is it more important for certain patients than others? For example, let's say patients who get stature lengthening versus and limb length discrepancies versus patients who are getting a bone graft for say they needed it after a, a tumor removal. Yeah, I think it it's a little bit dependent on, you know, the patient themselves and how much support they have. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I do lengthenings on people, sometimes I don't start physical therapy on them until six or eight weeks into the process because at home, you could tell they're just doing such a good job. They're being very diligent with exercises, um, whereas other patients, I basically start right away because, you know, it's just sometimes they need that, you know, formal environment to really, you know, do the, the exercises. So, I mean, I think what it comes down to is everyone needs it. You know, you have to be doing the exercises basically multiple times per day. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, you know, have no problem prescribing it while we're undergoing that process, but mm -hmm. um, it can be variable. I mean, if you, if you have a good setup at home and um, certainly it's even better if someone can help you kind of, you know, um, passively keep the, the joints up as well, that that's helpful, but um, it, it's definitely variable and I don't have a problem um, people doing it at home, if they seem to be doing a good job and, um, you know, keeping their joint range of motion, what it needs to be. Yep. And I guess you'll be able to see what's going on when they do the checkups, the weekly checkups. Yeah. That's I mean, we have to, anyone who's getting limb lengthening, you do have to keep an eye on because you yeah. need to, you're monitoring the distraction rate, making mm -hmm. sure they're making good regenerate. Um, so, you know, you can't really lose track of any of these people. So you do get kind of frequent checkups to determine, you know, how the therapy is going. Excellent. Excellent. Wow. Dr. Reeve. Well, you are a true talent. 
at a leading center that's known for its orthopedics at the HSS. Um, you treat patients with all sorts of conditions, limbic discrepancies, stature lengthening, uh, bone cancer, infections, all kinds of stuff. So um, for patients who, let's say, has one of these conditions or wants to get stature lengthening or fix a limbic discrepancy, how can they reach out to you? What's the best way that they can reach out to you? Um, and there's lots of ways. Um, mm -hmm. They can go to our website directly, www.limblengthening.com. Mm -hmm. um, there's both that one and um, slash that same address slash uh, HSS. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they can go through the HSS website, um, search for limb lengthening um, and find both myself and the group. Um, patients can email me directly, reift at hss.edu. Um, they can call my office at uh, 212-606-1637. Um, we try to make ourselves very available. And if people, you know, are trying to find us, um, you know, they can get hold of us. They can shoot me a message on uh, Instagram. I'm Lynn <laughs> Tumor Doc. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, we want our services to be out there for people to take advantage of. So we certainly don't want, um, you know, finding a way to contact us to be a barrier. I love it. I'll make sure of that because I'm going to post all your contact information to the show notes. So guys, if you want to reach out to Dr. Reef for a consultation, you can find all of that below. Well, Dr. Reef, any final words that you would like to say to patients who are either currently lengthening or would, you know, prospective patients who might be your future patients? Yeah. I mean, I think um, amazing things are possible, um, but it does uh, require um, you know, it requires time and patience and, you know, a lot of effort on the patient's part, you know, like we talked about with therapy and things. So, um, you know, unfortunately, these are not like quick fix sort of surgeries. And, um, but, you know, if you're willing to stick with it and, you know, you follow our instructions, we're kind of there, we're there with you the whole way. So, you know, you'll have all the guidance you need. But um, I, you know, I do see people in consultation sometimes who, you know, are surprised that, you know, it's, it, you know, bone is, bone takes how long bone takes to heal, you know, and <laughs> if we're doing an osteotomy, that's at least six weeks. And if you're doing a lengthening, you can only lengthen the bone, you know, so quickly, you know, a millimeter a day or less. So, yeah. um, you know, I think that's just one thing that, you know, as long as they're patient, uh, that, you know, we can, we can achieve amazing things. Um, so, and yeah, and that don't be afraid either. You know, I think some people, uh, are, are, you know, are so worried about like the pain involved with the process or anything, but I think we have enough tools at our disposal these days that, um, you know, certainly the acute pain from surgery, our anesthesiologists do a great job controlling that. Um, you know, and then afterwards, um, you know, we're always there to give people whatever they need. And I, most people need a lot less pain medication than you think. I mean, right. all these things are occurring slowly. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I think that that shouldn't be a reason why people, shy away from it. I think they should, if they're serious about something and they want to see a change in their life, they should go after it. Awesome. I love it. Well, there you have it, everybody. Words from the man himself, Dr. Taylor Reef of the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City in the United States. Dr. Reef, I want to thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. This was great. And it was, uh, it was a pleasure being on and meeting you. So excellent. Awesome. Seeing patients in the future. Yep. Man, I really love interviewing talented surgeons like Dr. Reef, who's skilled in multiple disciplines of orthopedics, oncology, limb lengthening, deformity reconstruction. It goes to show that he can not only fix your leg length discrepancies or make you taller through cosmetic stature lengthening, but he also treats bone tumors, metastatic disease, infections, and many other complex conditions. If you're interested in reaching out to Dr. Reef for a consultation, you can find all of his contact information in the show notes. Until next time, this is Victor from Cyborg for Life, signing out.